As Paul has just said, the readings today are from Psalm 133 and from Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 22. And I'm reading this morning from the New Living Translation. Psalm 133. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls in the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. Now we go to Ephesians chapter 2. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you, Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling, where God lives by his spirit. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Christine, for that wonderful reading. Let's pray together. Lord, we just ask that you would still our hearts now and that in this time you would take the bare bones of my thinking and put on the flesh by your spirit. Father, may it be a nourishing word to us today. Amen. Well, the psalmist says how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters get along. Having recently journeyed through France with a brother and a sister in the back seat of a car, I can tell you those words are true. It's good and pleasant when Esther and Daniel get along. And when they don't get along, well, there are other words for that. But as much as this psalm resonates with my summer travels, I don't think the psalmist had my holidays in mind when he penned these verses. Instead, these words are intended for our common life together. They're for the wide human family, not my nuclear family. How wonderful, how beautiful it is when neighbors get along. How good and pleasant it is when a people live in unity. I think we all get that, don't we? We instinctively know what the psalmist means here, whether it's the sound of siblings chatting happily in the back of the car, or the sight of an imam disarming protesters with simple hospitality, which you may have caught on the news. We instinctively recognize the good 
and the pleasant when we see it. But something struck me about this psalm, because the psalmist actually takes this a bit further. He says something that I find truly remarkable about such moments of harmony. And if you look again at that very last verse of the psalm with me, you'll see what I mean. There we discover that in this sweet spot of nearly belonging, heaven draws near. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Or as Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, that's where God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. What the psalmist is saying here is remarkable. He's saying that life lived in harmony with one another is nothing less than a taste of heaven on earth. Peterson reflects this very beautifully on his, in his book, um, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And in that book, he paints a picture of heaven as a party. This is what he writes. You'll see the words on the screen here. Heaven is like nothing quite so much as a good party. Assemble in your imagination all the friends you enjoy being with most, the companions who invoke the deepest joy, your most stimulating friendships, the most delightful of shared experiences, the people with whom you feel completely alive. That is a hint of heaven. For there God commands the blessing, ordains eternal life. I really like this picture of heaven. It appeals to my love of food and of people. I like the idea of heaven as this massive dinner table, surrounded by all my friends and loved ones and overflowing with the best food from Ormer Road and beyond. But as comforting as this image might be to me, events in Belfast in recent weeks have caused me to wonder whether my picture of heaven isn't just a bit too neat and tidy. Don't get me wrong, Peterson's party effectively conveys the feeling of heaven, but maybe the dinner table is too small. Maybe an intimate gathering with our nearest and dearest is too narrow. Maybe, just maybe, heaven is a little bit messier than that. And maybe it's all the more wonderful for it. You see, here's what I've come to realize as I've reflected on this psalm in light of the recent unrest. I've come to realize that if our imagined heaven is full of only people like us, if it's only our nearest and dearest, then we've missed the point. We've reduced the scope of God's blessing. And worst of all, we have tragically diminished the gospel. That's why this morning I thought it would be helpful to read this psalm in tandem with Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Because in these verses, the apostle gives us a bigger picture of God's coming kingdom. It's a kingdom, we read, where old walls of hostility and division are broken down. A kingdom where those who were far from God and alienated from each other are brought together in Christ. A kingdom where borders are erased and where those who were once strangers are built together into a new people. The very dwelling place of God, Paul says. It's one of those amazing pictures in the New Testament. As John Stott, some of you will know him, observes in his commentary, it's hard, in fact, for Paul to overstate the grandeur of his vision here. It couldn't be bigger. This is what Stott writes. The new society God has brought into being is nothing short of a new creation, a new human race whose characteristic is no longer alienation but reconciliation. No longer division and hostility, but unity and peace. This new society, God rules and loves and lives in. 
this new society is called the church. You see, what Paul gives us here is a radical reimagining of what it means to be the church, what it means to be human even. And make no mistake, there's nothing tidy or sanitized about this vision. If heaven is a dinner table, it's a messy dinner table. And that's why I find myself imagining a different sort of party now when I think of what heaven might be like. I find myself going back to a particular night out that I had about two years ago at the Waldorf Hotel. And no, I didn't say the Waldorf, that famous hotel in New York. I'm talking about the Waldorf Hotel. It's an establishment situated in Bethlehem, the town of Christ's birth. And it's so called because, as you can see in this picture, it sits under the shadow of the ugly separation wall that separates the West Bank from Israel and which indeed separates Palestinian communities within the West Bank itself. The hotel is owned by the anonymous artist Banksy and it makes a feature of its ugly neighbor. If you go on its website, you'll read an ironic boast like this, that it has floor to ceiling views of graffiti strewn concrete from almost every room. But it was at this very hotel when I was there for the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference. This hotel which is overshadowed by an unhappy reminder of the walls of hostility that still exist in our world today. In this hotel that I got my closest glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. Because surrounding me that evening at a birthday party, I think it was, were brothers and sisters from all over the world and from every part of Christ's church. I remember on my left sat a Southern Baptist gentleman from the United States and on my right, a Pentecostal woman from South Africa. And we sat listening as Palestinian musicians played jazz from New Orleans, while guests from Israel and Germany, from Korea, from other parts of Europe, Catholics and Protestants shared drinks and chatted together and strangers talked as if they were old friends. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live in unity, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even eternal life. But of course, even that positive memory has a shadow side. The hotel where I glimpsed heaven is currently closed. It's been closed for some time. Like much of that region, life has been put on hold since October of last year. That wall of hostility remains and indeed seems higher than ever. And you know, sometimes when we're faced with walls like this, we can despair. We can despair that our reality falls so short of the biblical vision painted for us in Paul by Paul. Christ has torn down the walls, but we seem set on building them up again. But I want to say to you today that we shouldn't despair, not if we're the church, because there is hope in these words of Paul to us. And that hope comes in the form of both a comfort and a challenge. And the comfort is that heaven's coming God's eternal kingdom coming to earth doesn't depend on us. The fate of the world does not depend on our goodness, doesn't depend on our faithfulness, it doesn't depend on our courage or our unity or anything else. That's because there's only one Savior and he's already come. As Paul reminds us, it is Christ and Christ alone who is the cornerstone upon which this kingdom is built. He's the one whose goodness matters, whose faithfulness matters. And it's in him that we're built together. As Christ himself says, I am building my church and even the gates of hell won't stand against it. So that's the comfort. It doesn't depend on us, but there's also a paradoxical challenge that goes with it. And the challenge is that nevertheless, what we do here matters. It really matters. 
somehow in the mystery of God's providence, our actions in this life have ramifications for eternity. Now, there's a tension here between the comfort of God being in control and the challenge of our responsibility, and it's really, really hard for us to understand. It's a mystery to us. But this is the messiness of the church. This is the wonderful messiness, the beautiful messiness of the kingdom of God. It's the terrifying and awesome reality that God invites us, you and me, to participate with him in bringing heaven to earth. That's incredible. I think I was a student at university when I first grasped this truth. And knowing me, I grasped it in a book I was reading, a book called Surprised by Hope by Tom Wright. This had a really profound impact on my thinking. In that book, Wright really helpfully likens God to this great architect. And he's designing and building this beautiful cathedral, a bit like this one we visited in France in the summer. And the thing is that this architect tasks each one of us to be stonemasons in the building of this kingdom, which is the new creation. And our task is to chisel and to shape our individual pieces of stone. And then the architect will somehow take these pieces and use them in the construction of this great project. Now, the thing is, our stones will be of different sizes and shapes. Some of us will work on them for a long time. Some of us not that long. The quality will vary. Some stones will be simple. Some will be ornate. But each stone will have a part to play. Each piece will be vital in the great jigsaw of God's coming kingdom. Because what we do matters and we are built together into this dwelling place of God. Friends, in this church, we have work to do as Christ Church here in the Ormer Road. We need to continue to be a beacon of light and hope to the people here in South Belfast. Maybe even more so in the wake of the violent disturbance on our streets. We need to have the strength to continue to show that love and welcome to the stranger among us. And we need to have the courage to knock down a few walls from time to time. But we need to do something else too. We need to do some building. We need to keep building that messy church Paul envisions in his letter. And that means that a measure of our faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus will surely be that our life together here will look messier and more beautiful in the next decade. If we're to be faithful to our calling, our congregation here should better reflect the wonderful diversity of heaven in the next 10 years that we find on the streets around us. And that's going to require two things from us. That's going to require courage, but it's also going to require patience. Courage to step out into that messiness and the uncertainty of how God might shape us. And patience, patience to put up with some things we might not like. See, the tension I have as your minister is that I'm always trying to navigate this tension between tradition and innovation. Because, you know, I will have people who will come and say to me, I don't like those modern hymns. I don't like that you're not wearing a collar. And I've got others that will say to me, do you know, I listen online, I would come to St. John's if it wasn't so traditional. Well, all I can say is that if our church is going to look like the church Christ died for, that is a church of messy diversity, the traditional and the innovative, then we need to be at peace that some things are not going to be of our taste. So let me comfort and challenge you today that in the years to come, there will be space here for the organ, but there'll also be space for drums. There will be room here for the choir, and for the praise group. There will be scope for metrical psalms and the best of contemporary worship. And most importantly for all of us, there will be an opportunity for each of us to be blessed by the riches of world Christianity, not just the riches of our Western tradition. 
So what I'm saying to you today as your minister at the beginning of a new term is to be courageous and be patient. Be part of this new thing God is doing. Because I'm excited about this community. I couldn't wait to get back. Because I believe God is building something beautiful here. And I pray that we would all help each other to be faithful to that vision so that we might more and more reflect the messy and wonderful diversity of the kingdom of heaven. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live in unity. For there, God gives his blessing. There he bestows eternal life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.